I said, I come here this evening to share Dhamma together. And uh, by the uh, act of choosing to be here, choosing to share this space and this time together, um, we're making a significant commitment uh, of and a significant effort. towards this goal of spiritual practice and something which we recognize as of value in our lives. Something that we recognize is worth uh, sacrificing for, putting aside the other concerns that we might have making space, making time. And this is not something uh, which we should take for granted. It's so easy to <clears throat> not make the time. It's so easy to treat uh, dharma and the spiritual life as being uh, the least important thing in our life. Actually, it should be the most important thing. And dharma is something which can give a uh, an orientation and a depth and a resonance to everything else that we do. When I was in <coughs> Thailand and uh, went to uh, an ordination ceremony of some of my good friends, I had ordained shortly after I was, and uh, <coughs> the ordination teacher, Ajahn Mahamon, uh, said that, that uh, uh, t talked about this, this Thai dessert, because if you're living in Thailand, then everything comes back to food eventually, right? <laughs> so they, he talked about what they call gui bort chi, which uh, literally <coughs> means uh, bananas ordained as nuns. <laughs> so in Thailand, the, the nuns wear these white robes, and uh, bananas ordained as nuns is bananas which are cooked in coconut oil, co uh, sorry, coconut milk. So that uh, they're in this, they're all in white, like the nuns in their white robes, and um, and so he was saying, just like the um, bananas, when they're cooked in coconut milk, are much richer and sweeter and more delicious than ordinary bananas. The same thing uh, with the ordained life is much richer and sweeter and more delicious than ordinary life. So uh, that's the, the flavor of Dhamma that uh, our life has when it has a Dhamma in it. I don't know about you, but, but I think for many of us, certainly for myself, the, the, um, there's, uh, or in, in coming to Dhamma, there was a strong feeling of um, a, a need for meaning and a search for meaning. <clears throat> and this is something that's been important for me uh, as long as I can remember. And so there are various uh, things that I thought were providing with me with meaning and providing me with, with happiness, my friends, relationships, um, my music, and so on. And they all provided me with something, some kind of sustenance, some kind of sense of uh, who I am, uh, 
uh, a way of expression and some kind of a sense of wholeness. And yet there's also a sense in which those things uh, are very limited and a sense in which they, they, they can just take you so far. After, my, after I did my first retreat in Thailand and uh, when, I, when I first went over to Thailand, I'd uh, tried to get work in Chiang Mai playing music in the various nightclubs and restaurants and so on around town playing guitar and uh, nobody was interested to give me a job and uh, so I did this meditation retreat for a month and that retreat was a very profound experience for me. I went through a lot of different um, uh, phases during the retreat, the periods of intense suffering and physical pain, uh, tears and crying, periods of great joy and lightness of heart, uh, sort of crammed almost like a whole lifetime of uh, feeling and experience and wisdom and foolishness and into into just a month. And one of the things which I learned, one of the things which I noticed was how um, uh, just this this notion of 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 reflection of looking back into oneself and of understanding the nature of my own mind. You know, we, we talk about doing meditation, we, we, we talk about you know, understanding your mind or finding peace of mind or finding happiness and uh, so on. But of course these are, ju these are just like ideas. You know, we have an idea of what these things are. But our experience of these things, if we haven't done any uh, deep meditation, our experience of these things is, is very shallow. It's very, uh, you know, I, I really think before I did that retreat, I really just did, don't think I knew what those things meant. If you said to me, peace of mind, I really don't think I would have known what that meant. The clarity of awareness, these, these were kind of notions which had no meaning for me. And even though, uh, you know, I'm, I, I, I'm somebody who um, I always kind of like to read, and so I'm, you know, reasonably well educated. I kind of read the, the great novelists and the great philosophers, and taken an interest in um, science and the philosophy of science and so on. And uh, so, you know, had a, reason, had a reasonable kind of knowledge certainly in terms of the Western sort of intellectual sphere. Uh, and yet I'd never really come across these, uh, this idea, this basic idea, this fundamental idea of reflecting and looking directly into one's own mind. And this idea which is actually right at the heart of the, the entire Indian tradition. It's very much a characteristic of the Indian um, sort of <coughs> philosophical spiritual tradition. Not just Buddhism, but, but all of the Indian traditions. And so if you'd told me about these things or talked to me about them, they would have just kind of drifted by me. I, I, I wouldn't really have seen what these things mean. And so it was when I uh, had the chance to spend this time on retreat um, that I really um, started to started to um, 
apprehend these things for the first time. And one of the great things about that particular retreat was that they didn't teach you anything. So they just they basically just told you to meditate. They said this is how you meditate, and you just did it. And uh, they didn't give in. There was no no dhamma talks on the retreat. No teaching. No framework. Nothing. And so I basically had no um, nothing really to help me get through that, except for my own dogged persistence. And but not just dogged persistence, but somehow inside me there was a seed of faith. And I don't know where that comes from, and I don't know why I've had it, but, I, but, I, but it's always been there. And I remember actually even much earlier in my life, you know, brought up in a, in a Catholic family and so on, I never had much contact with uh, Buddhism. And, uh, you know, in those days, and like in the 70s and that, then the Buddhism was not nearly as prevalent as it is today. So, you know, I kind of let go of my Catholic beliefs when I was a teenager. And... Uh, but there were a few times, I remember one, um, I used to be, one of the things I used to be part of uh, Animal Liberation. And uh, I remember one of the members uh, of the group, it uh, uh, was someone who was really, well, she just had this kind of something special about her. I'm not quite sure, she's this kind of older lady and who, who just had some kind of bit of an aura, a bit of charisma, a bit of a kind of a zing to her presence. And then somebody said, oh yeah, she's a Buddhist meditator. And uh, there was a kind of connection there, kind of a feeling of connection, but I um, didn't, didn't really follow it through. Or another example was a, a, a friend of mine called uh, Ross Bolliter, who if, uh, if you're familiar with the Zen circles in Australia, you might be familiar with, he became a, a Roshi in the, uh, the Diamond Sangha. And uh, when I knew him, in the 1980s, he was a, a, a Zen meditator, but I knew him as a particularly mad musician. And among all of the mad musicians that I knew, he was possibly the maddest. And uh, he used to do things like, um, he used to travel into the middle of the West Australian desert and go to abandoned farmhouses and find ruined pianos in old sheds and then sit there and record music on these things for hours on end and <laughs> make records of these ruined piano music uh, and various kinds of things like that. Uh, he did another one where he was, he had a group, an improvisation group, and they played a gig at a, uh, an, a, a convention of astronomers in the WA University and they received the, the, they got the signal from a pulsar uh, and received it at a radio telescope in New South Wales and then beamed via satellite and then put through a synthesizer with these things in, in coming out in these kind of random sounds, unpredictable, being beamed from the cosmos. And, and then they had to sort of jam with this thing as it was, <laughs> as it was happening at the astronomers' conference. Yeah? So... Uh, <laughs> These are the kinds of things which he'd get up to, and uh, we. He, but he was a beautiful piano player, and uh, we we um, we got him to do some recording with us, and we had this this very lovely sort of ballad, which uh, our singer Peggy had written, and uh, so I invited Ross to come and play piano on this thing, and you know it's it's a very kind of lovely kind of plaintive, sorrowful love song kind of thing. And, and uh, 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 Ross immediately came in. We invited him to play piano. He immediately started taking the cymbals off the drum kit, putting them inside the piano and, and, and plucking the strings and playing like slide piano. We were sort of standing around and saying, uh, Ross, do you, do you want a chord chart or something like that at all? <laughs> Anything you want to... So, uh, yeah, that was a... Uh, anyway, and he was... He was a Buddhist as well and a meditator. And again, I kind of knew that and there was some kind of respect for that. And, um, uh, but it didn't take it any further. So I had these kind of encounters during my life. Um, so somehow, I don't know why, I guess maybe it's from past lives or something like that, but there was some kind of 
seed of faith that I've always had in me. And uh, which I think is, for me, is, is quite interesting to reflect on. Uh, uh, that I, I, for some for some reason, I'm not sure why, I've got this very, very deep faith in, in the Dhamma. And so when I came to this, to this retreat, um, of course there were many things that I could have doubted about. Yeah? Is this the right place? Are they teaching the right way? What should I be doing? Blah, blah, blah. And I, so I could have made a big problem out of it. But, I, but for some reason... I just just plunged into it, and there were a lot of other. It was you know it was a retreat center. They had uh, you know Westerners and travelers and so on practicing there. So a lot of people did have problems, and there's a lot of people having doubts and complaints and so on about the place. But I just got on with my practice, and uh, I found it to be enormously beneficial. And I remember one uh, day, one afternoon, uh, coming out. In the late afternoon, this was in the, in the hot season in Chiang Mai, so it was very hot and stifling weather. I'm coming out in the, in the middle of the afternoon and just uh, sitting quietly under the, the trees and having a cup of tea or something like that. And, and just really noticing for the first time, this is these little moments that you just never forget, just really noticing for the first time that my awareness had just become so clear. I could I, I could see it, all the colors were vibrant and alive. Everything I could hear it was was clarified and purified and vivid. Everything I taste, if I'm drinking the, the cup of tea or something, everything, everything in my experience was just so much more alive. You know, it's like switching over from black and white telly to color telly or something like that, or from a mono sound to stereo sound or something like that. It just everything had come alive. And so this is, this is how gradually uh, I came to, to realize the, 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 the profundity and the importance of this contemplation and this understanding of awareness. What, what, is, what is that in there? What is that sense of awareness, that sense of knowing? And when I, when I uh, you know, went through many different uh, kinds of experiences on that, that uh, retreat, it was a very intensive retreat. We were practicing 14 hours a day for, for a month. And then at the end of the retreat, they have a special little uh, uh, thing at the end there where you don't sleep for a few days. So you just practice for, I think, four days I did at the end where you don't, don't sleep. Just meditate through the night. And, uh, of course, if you don't go mad, which is <laughs> decidedly possible, uh, then you certainly uh, investigate some interesting states of uh, understanding of certainly the first noble truth. It becomes uh, quite apparent to you <laughs> in those early hours of the night. Uh, but very fascinating to see also because of that that, proce that reflective process, bringing everything back, constantly bringing everything back, constantly bringing everything back, constantly reflecting, con constantly bringing the mind back into oneself. And then it just it did it just develops this kind of this uh, self-generating process or the self-energizing process, uh, so that by the end of that period, actually you know the, the, the final day, you really just feel fine, you don't really feel tired or sleepy or anything like that, you know, you feel quite, quite fine. And, uh, and then I remember going along to my last interview on the retreat, and they sort of did that, and then they said, okay, you're, you know, your retreat's over now, congratulations, and uh, <coughs> you sort of go back to your room, and then you think, oh, what do I do now? Well, maybe... Might as well do some meditation. <laughs> Don't have anything else to do. And uh, so, just and that that time when I went back and I did had that sit, that was one of the the most profound sits that I had, and I can still remember that uh, particular time. And, and I was just kind of sitting there. It was around midday, and just kind of sitting, and uh, it feel, felt like everything just dropped away. Just boom. 
just just look almost like I could look down. There's everything just became like sitting on a well. This everything fell fell away, and there was just nothing left. Just this kind of abyss. But that's just a perception, it's just a way of seeing. So this is what I learnt during that retreat, is that there are these different ways of seeing. And when I came out, um, you know, is it karma, or is it, is it developing a baramis or merit, or whatever it is, I don't know. But I went back to the guest house where I'd been staying in, in Chiang Mai, and uh, the owners of the guest house said to me that they wanted to adopt me as their son in Thailand. And uh, they said, uh, stay here as long as you like. You don't have to pay anything for the room. Um, and you know, we'll give you all the food and meals and things you need. And, uh, and the, the owner of the guest house went to school with Thailand's biggest rock band, or second biggest rock band. And uh, he knew all the musicians in town, so they'd find me plenty of gigs playing music around town and recording and blah, blah, blah. And uh, so that's what I ended up doing, staying there, and I'd go and play two or three gigs per night. And um, in the daytime, go to the monastery and study Abhidhamma. And uh, the other thing I did, which was really fun, was I used to uh, did some English teaching in some of the villages around Chiang Mai. So I used to go around to the little villages and teach teach uh, English to the little kids there, which was great fun. So I was doing all of these things, and uh, so one of the things I noticed about you know you know what I was doing with with playing music um, that <coughs> that. Uh, meditation that I'd done and the skills that I'd learned through meditation uh, were definitely something that I could bring to music and bring to, to learning that, that, that craft of playing the guitar in a very positive way. And I actually became very, um, uh, very uh, diligent. I was practicing a lot uh, and both in terms of doing uh, formal formal practice, but also in terms of being being very creative and so on, uh, in that period of time. And uh, so, you know, I could really see that, that, that positive benefit of meditation as being something that could be applied you know, to, you know, that was just my particular craft, that's what I did, I played guitar, so I brought it to that. And, you know, you can really see the benefits of that, absolutely, and I had no doubt that that was of, of tremendous benefit in pursuing that. But I could also see that on the other side of that was uh, a sense of emptiness. And that was, I guess, a, um, a function of, of, of where I was at in my personal development. That, that, that perhaps I'd, I'd, I'd grown or done what I needed to do with music and playing guitar and those kinds of things. And so even though... Uh, yeah, in a sense, I was becoming a better musician or better guitar player than I'd ever been. But also, uh, uh, it didn't mean anything to me anymore. Uh, it didn't mean anything, uh, and it had done my whole, you know, my whole adult life. It had been the sort of the main, one of the main um, uh, things that I'd done to provide that sense of meaning, sense of identity, and so on. Maybe I just didn't need it anymore. Maybe I'd outgrown it. Maybe. I don't know why. But you could see that uh, whatever it was, it was very external. You know, it's an external expression. And compared with the, the depth, the refinement, the subtlety of meditation, then anything that I was able to do with my fingers and my hands and playing guitar was very... Uh, is so limited and so um, coarse and so shallow. So there was this kind of two-sided thing. On one side, the ability to, to actually uh, enhance those worldly things, which definitely was there, but also a sort of a deeper sense of meaning, like a deeper kind of current, which was leading me in another direction. 
So I kind of j juggled with these these different things for a period of time uh, before, of course, as you can see, fairly obvious which choice I made in the end. <laughs> and uh, but one of the things that I also found in that period, which I, I was very di very um, mm, uh, difficult but quite um, striking, was was uh, quite a strong. I had quite a strong sense of alienation. In you know, just in t in being with people and talking with people, you know, after I'd come out of my retreat, I just felt most people that I met just just didn't get it. They just didn't understand, and I found it very difficult to to communicate uh, about the things that were important to me. Yeah, and so you know, you're sort of staying in a backpackers, and there's tourists around, and they're going shopping, and they're going on treks, and they're going to nightclubs, and all of this kind of stuff. And it just, it just didn't mean anything to me anymore. Not that it meant much to me beforehand. <laughs> it certainly didn't mean anything to me afterwards. So I can, so the, you know, sometimes people come to me and, and, and ask me for their advice. You know, how do you, how do you practice the Dhamma while, while living in the world? And of course, I don't know why they come to me for advice on that. <laughs> I'm a complete failure at trying to practice Dhamma while living in the world. That's why I became a monk. Uh, but I can certainly appreciate the problem, yeah? and this is, I think, one of the, you know, the, the things the Buddha said was so important was what they called kalyana mitata, is good friendship, and spiritual friendship, and spiritual support. Uh, and that's one of the great things that we have in staying in a monastery is you know you're around people who under they get it, they understand. Yeah? What's meditation? Why do you want to spend time sitting by yourself in a hut in the middle of the forest? Yeah? We share a set of uh, values. We share a direction, and so that's very mutually supportive all the time. You know, it's this kind of undercurrent uh, of, of of shared beliefs and so on. So, this is something which uh, you know. Hopefully, this little group that we have on a Friday night does something to to provide that for each of you. It provides a place where you can come. And also meet other people interested in Dhamma, interested in meditation, and that will help to um, uh, support you in your practice. To realize that you're not alone; you're not the only weird person in the world. <laughs> there are others just as weird. So that's always nice. There's a sense of there's there's something good about that. So, you know, one of the um, one of the um, I guess one of the the problems of, of spiritual practice or something as as we go on is that that the uh, our original insight. You know, if I look back at my my time as a, as, a, as a practitioner, you know, you, you get that original insight is is very much into a, a, a personal and, and spiritual experience. So it's just, how does that feel within myself? What is that sense of knowing? And then understanding thought. Oh, okay, this is my thoughts going down in that direction. Now understanding emotion, looking at the different way emotions move in the body and so on. Understanding, seeing something about perception. Yeah, understanding how the mind is creating uh, its realities and its fantasies out of the sense data which is presented to us. So we're, we're sort of deconstructing and understanding the nature of our own experience and realizing that, of course, this is all impermanent, this is all uncertain, this is all uh, conditioned. It's always changing. And as we look deeper and deeper within that, we try to find, well, well who am I? Yeah? There's this question of not-self in Buddhism. Who am I? Yeah? And that's, uh, for, for, for people who haven't done spiritual practice, then that's, uh, of course, a very banal question. You say, well, my name's Anthony Best. I'm a guitar player. I was born in Perth in... 
1966 and blah, blah, blah. And that's who I am. You have this kind of sense of identity. But the deeper we go into meditation, the closer you look at it, the more it breaks up, the more it disappears. What actually, what actually is the I? What, what am I? And this is not dissimilar to what happens, for example, if we, if we, if we, the same thing happens actually if you look closely at anything, you know. So, if it's, you know, even for the physicists, you look at matter, and you say, "What is matter?" And you, you, the further you go into it, you see matter is made up of atoms. You say, "Well, well at the idea of an atom really is just a kind of an abstraction. There's not really atoms. There's these kind of." energy things moving in space or something like that, but even space is not really space. And then there's these kind of string things maybe, but we don't really know what strings are or if they are, any of them. And they're, they're wrapped up in 11 dimensions or something like that. So you kind of begin, you, 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 I just, it used to be just a table. It was so simple, I could just put my cup on it and, and there it was. Yeah. Now, I, now I'm worried because I put my cup on it and it's just going to disappear through the, <laughs> through the top of the table. I don't know. And it, once you ask that question, like what is matter, you know, from a physicist's point of view, would say, well, actually, it's the wrong kind of question to be asking. Because what you're asking, that you're asking, uh, you, you're assuming. The question assumes that there is this kind of solid stuff called matter. And actually, when we look into the nature of physical reality, we don't really find anything that corresponds to matter as such. It's just, it's just a concept that we use that has a certain, certain um, uh, utility for certain kinds of questions. And so Buddhism has exactly the same attitude towards this idea of the self or the I, the identity. You ask, who am I? When we start out, then this, this seems like a relevant question. But the further we go into our practice, actually becomes quite a misleading question. You ask, who am I? It means there is an I, yeah, which I can identify with. There's an I somewhere in there. And the Buddha said, actually, this is, we shouldn't ask this question. Yeah. This is one of the, the uh, because it's already assuming the answer that there is a self. So that teaching of not self is much more radical. So perhaps we should ask, um, uh, instead of who, is, who am I, we should ask, well, what is there? Or what is happening, perhaps? That's a better. But whatever question we ask, we're going to reach the end of it somewhere. And whatever sense of identity, sense of self that we have, when we investigate that point of what I am, that point will dissolve. Yeah. And so one of the I guess the paradoxes of, of spiritual practice is that uh, having uh, come into Buddhism from a sense of uh, wanting to dissolve or feeling of a sense of dissolving of self, or dissolving of identity, dissolving of attachments and, and all of these things, you then decide to get attached to being a Buddhist. <laughs> you get a sense of identity, who are you? Oh, I'm a Buddhist monk. So you get something, it's a whole new set of things that you can get attached to. And that can be quite a trap. Yeah? And uh, certainly among the, the monastic community, there are many things that we can get attached to. Yeah? We're, we're from the, the greatest lineage here, yeah? we're from the, the noble lineage of the forest masters. Yeah? And so we can be very proud of that. The fact that the forest masters got to be masters because they got rid of their pride. <laughs> Is another matter entirely. So you know we can think, oh, we're Buddhists, you know, and uh, you know we believe in in reason and and uh, and and truth and not kind of blind faith like all those other religions. So you get a sense of pride about your religion. Buddhism is good because you don't have to believe your ancient scriptures. See, it says so in our ancient scriptures. <laughs> and so you can get a sense of pride about being a Buddhist. Yeah? And you can think that um, Buddhism is so good that, that it becomes a, a way of, of, say, putting down people who have different beliefs or people who have 
a different um, believe in a different kind of Buddhism. There was a uh, there was a joke about that. This fellow's walking along the ro a road, comes to a bridge, and there's a man on the bridge about to throw himself off, about to kill himself. And the other man says, "Wait," he says, "My friend," he says, "Don't, don't, don't, don't do it." He says, "He says, uh, you know, do do you believe in God?" He says, "Yes." He says, "I believe in God." He says, "And and what 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 you know?" So, so we both believe in God together. He says, you know, but are you, are you a, like a Catholic or a Protestant? He says, oh, I'm a Protestant. He says, well, you know, be Baptist or whatever. He says, I'm from Baptist. He says, hey, but are you from the pre-reformed Baptist or the post-reformed Baptist? He says, well, from the post-reformed. Was that with the reform of 1874 or the reform of 1892? He says, from the reform of 1892. He says, well, throw yourself off then. <laughs> <laughs> So that's a very uh, true statement about the nature of our religious beliefs. It starts out all very well, doesn't it? Yeah? If you look at all the great religions and things, they all start out well. And they start out with an expansion. Yeah? They, they all start out with an expansion of our sense of humanity, an expansion of our sense of love, our expansion of our sense of connectedness and understanding. And letting go of our pettiness and of our narrow-mindedness and all of those things, and it's that same expansion, which is the the um, the the speciality of the meditative experience. That letting go of the narrowness and the boundaries and the the tightness around our sense of who we are <coughs> in the world. And in the experience of meditation, all of those things dissolve and they go away. So this is one of the, the great things about Buddhism is it gives us the means to do this. It doesn't just talk about it, but it gives us the means, the actual contemplative practices which allow us to dissolve our boundaries. But when that's happened and when afterwards the habits kick in the mind tends to go back to the same ways of thinking we tend to get attached to who we are we get attached to this particular meditation method our method is right the other method is wrong we get attached to our school of buddhism theravada it's the real authentic teaching of the buddha and all those mahayanas all, all, all completely lost the plot or else you say, oh, well, you know, Buddhists are right, and all the, the Christians and Muslims and everything, they, they just believe in blind faith in this, this God that doesn't exist. You know, or you, 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 well, you know, whatever, whatever it is, at whatever level, these things can kick back in. The kind of the idea, the narrow mindedness, the literalness, the, the, um, the, uh, all of those things which we were practicing in order to overcome in the first place. So it's important that we um, notice this and that we allow or that we, we um, help and we facilitate the, the, the movement between and the integration between these two different spheres. So this sphere of the inner contemplative life the realization of the truth of one's own consciousness. And then also that aspect of our life which is, which is moving in the world, which is communicating, which is relating, which is uh, making a living, which is uh, uh, constructing an environment, a home that we live in. And those two parts those two aspects of our spiritual life need to be in constant communication. And if there's a boundary um, that uh, uh, sticks between those things, then our spiritual practice will not be mature, will not be integrated.
so one of the uh, reasons why I, I've, I've started to, to think along these lines and, and this, this kind of notion of identity or what it means to be a Buddhist, because we were talking just before the talk this evening, we are talking about the um, terrible situation at the moment in Sri Lanka with the, uh, uh, the fighting that's been going on there for so long. And, uh, of course, it's one of the great tragedies of this conflict is that uh, religion has become a part of it and that religious ideology is uh, used by both sides, by some people on both sides, in order to justify the conflict and justify the war. And, uh, of course, this is very sad, and it's especially sad in the case of Buddhism, where, of course, you, <laughs> you don't really have any excuse. I mean, if you want to... Uh, look in the Bible, for example, and find some warlike passages to justify your actions. Well, you can find plenty. Uh, you can find plenty of peaceful passages as well. Uh, but in the Buddhist scriptures, you can't actually find any warlike passages to justify your acts. But nevertheless, it still happens. And so, you know, of course, the causes of war and conflict are very complex. And uh, uh, the, the social, political... Uh, dimensions of it are very important. But I think the uh, as this conflict seems to be coming into its last phase and we're all, uh, uh, I'm sure, very concerned about the fate, especially of the civilians, the innocent, who get caught up in these things uh, and who suffer the danger from other people's ideologies and other people's uh, issues. Uh, and so... I uh, would just like to remind you to, to spare a thought for those people and uh, also to uh, do what we can. I'm sure there's now a huge refugee problem which is emerging because of that. And uh, we were saying, they were saying before that some of the temples and so on are starting to organize help for the refugees. So if, if you can all uh, do what we can to, to support that, I think this is very important. And it's particular. Of course, it's always important to do this from just a humanitarian uh, basis to realize that these people are suffering and that they need help. But even more so uh, in this particular case, um, because the uh, religious response to this, to the aftermath of this conflict, is going to be a major factor, which will determine whether the, the long-term scars and wounds in Sri Lanka are able to heal themselves. And if uh, the Buddhist community is shown to be very proactive, very compassionate, uh, and very uh, offering a helping hand and a healing hand uh, to, 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 to try to repair things as best as possible, then that will be for the long term for the great benefit uh, of those people who have been afflicted so badly in this conflict. So it's just an appeal for uh, everybody uh, right now to, to spare some thought and to, to, to try to do what we can to uh, help the people in that situation.